Yeah, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about the fertilizer forecaster, which uh, builds on some of the concepts uh, that you've heard uh, from the previous present presenters. Um, and really, it's this idea of, of you know improving daily decision making and nutrient management. Uh, as the others have already pointed out, and you know if you apply fertilizers and manures uh, at the wrong time, you know that increases the risk of surface water contamination. And you've heard, for as one example, either fish kills in streams or just uh, adversely affecting water quality. Uh, and it's really a timing issue. A lot of our site assessment tools that we currently use, uh, with the phosphorus index being probably the best example, uh, these are seasonal in nature. Uh, so they provide, you know, either seasonal or annual kind of outlooks as to where it's. Um, opportune to apply nutrients to, to fields, but there really aren't very many tools, or they're starting to be, but there haven't been very many tools that offer the daily recommendations uh, for operational decision making. Um, and a good kind of example on the bottom right here of why, um, you know, these timing issues are important. Uh, you can see if you just look at the red bars here, this is if you applied phosphorus at a nitrogen-based rate. And at the bottom, you'll see if, if a rainfall event comes two days after uh, that phosphorus or that manure is applied, you can have, you know, fairly sizable dissolved reactive phosphorus concentrations and runoff upwards of 14 or 15 milligrams per liter. In this instance, uh, if that same rainfall event came nine days later, instead, uh, your concentrations are, are more than halved. Um, and so these timing issues are really critical. Uh, you're basically applying manure at the right time to reduce those kind of incidental nutrient losses or the wash off of phosphorus and nitrogen, you know, to, when you apply manure, you know, right after or right following um, a rainfall runoff event. And so the fertilizer forecaster is seen, uh, you know, as a way of getting at the when and where uh, in terms of fertilizer and manure application. Um, and so the, just the basic nuts and bolts of the project is, is to really evaluate various runoff forecasting models. And you've already heard that, uh, you know, through uh, Zach Easton's leadership, we have a publication in Journal of Environmental Quality that looks at a lot of the tools that you're hearing about today and compares them you know, qualitatively, you know, you know, based on their various characteristics uh, and conceptual underpinnings. Um, in our project, we have a, an advisory team that includes state agencies and farmers and researchers uh, to help guide us in the development of our tool. Um, and we're currently testing a kind of a prototype system uh, and we hope to have this system more available to the public, uh, at least in the watersheds where we're working uh, by the end of the summer. Um, our project is, fo is mostly focused in Pennsylvania, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay part of um, Pennsylvania, the upper Chesapeake Bay. And we have four project watersheds where we're working, and that really, the watersheds are, are meant to span the physiography of uh, the upper Chesapeake. So we have Anderson Creek in the Allegheny Plateau, uh, which is um, largely uh, underlain by uh, sedimentary rock. Um, Spring Creek uh, in the Ridge and Valley region uh, is a limestone karst watershed. Uh, Mahantango Creek uh, in East Central Pennsylvania is underlain by shale. And then in the Piedmont region, we have uh, Conewago Creek, uh, which is probably the most intensively farmed of the four watersheds, you know, where we're currently working. And similar to the tool that's Steve was describing, uh, you know, in the tool that Wisconsin is using and some of the other states in the north central U.S., um, it's the Sacramento uh, soil moisture accounting model, uh, more specifically the heat transfer version of that model, and it operates on a two-by-two two kilometer grid in our neck of the woods, and we're working with the Middle Atlantic River Forecast Center uh, and using this model to try to get at runoff generation in small headwater basins. And so we've tried to corroborate some of the model predictions in our, in our experimental watershed, Mantango Creek. It's where we have some of our best observations of stream flow and field scale runoff and things like that, soil moisture. Uh, and so we've extracted two components of that model. Um, this Sacramento model is actually uh, NOAA's flagship flood forecasting model, so it's used nationally for flood forecasting. And like Wisconsin, we've borrowed a couple time series out of that model to get at the, the runoff components. And so this just shows kind of a gridded view of the model, various sub-basins, you know, that we were trying to simulate in the Mantango Creek watershed. And here uh, you can see this grid cell here corresponds with uh, W38, which is our uh, 7.3 square kilometer or 
three and a half square mile watershed that's about the size of one of the grid cells uh, from the Sacramento model. So when we look at this inner flow and surface runoff component, we see that it does a pretty good job of capturing uh, what we would deem to be surface runoff or storm flow uh, generation from that small watershed. Uh, and so basically that's taking the base flow component out and only looking at the, the stream flow that's being generated by uh, surface runoff or, or you know, during storms. Uh, and so we get a pretty good correspondence between those two, and that lends confidence in the, in the model's ability to kind of capture those processes at that scale. We've also looked at soil moisture patterns because soil moisture is a, is a really important variable that affects runoff generation. Uh, and so the Sacramento model actually expresses soil moisture as a saturation ratio, uh, which is really just a function of volumetric water content, permanent wilting point, and porosity. Um, all you really need to know is that um, when we look at the saturation ratio that the model produces and compare that against the volumetric water content that we measure with soil moisture sensors in the field, if we fixate on the top 25 centimeters, um, you can see that the model does a pretty good job of capturing these surface saturation levels, um, which also gives us confidence the model can forecast soil moisture you know, into the future. Um, and two, just one interesting thing to point out, when we consider field capacity of, our, of the soils in, in, in our experimental basin, it's about 0.25 or 25%. And that corresponds with the saturation ratio of about 0.6. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because we took uh, the saturation ratios from the Sacramento model and compared them against the runoff coefficient, which is loosely interpreted as the fraction of the watershed that's expected to, you would expect to be generating runoff. Um, and when we do that, we see this interesting relationship, uh, you know, where at about a saturation ratio of 0.6, um, you know, anything 0.6 or less, it's really only about 2% of the watershed or, or less that's generating runoff. But anywhere above 0.6, uh, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to move ahead there. But anywhere above 0.6, you can see that that runoff coefficient jumps up quite a bit. And so once the watershed is sufficiently saturated, you can have a much larger fraction of the watershed that's generating runoff or a greater area where runoff generation is likely occurring. And so that's kind of how we built um, our basin scale or grid scale runoff risk threshold. So these are threshold rules that we've set up to govern, you know, how we look at the risk of runoff at say the two by two kilometer grid cell scale um, in, the, in, in the Sacramento model that we're using. Basically, when the saturation ratio is less than 0.6 and the runoff coefficient is less than 0.02 or 2% of the watershed, that's you, the green area you can see here, right near the streams. If you just added up the whole area that's, that, that's green, that's about 2% of the watershed. Um, that's, that we call that low risk. Um, moderate risk would be when you, once you get above 0.6 saturation uh, and your runoff coefficient lies between 0.02 and 0.2, uh, then you're kind of at a moderate risk where upwards of 20% of the watershed could be generating runoff. And high risk is any time when the saturation ratio is above 0.6 and, you know, sufficiently wet enough and, and enough rainfall uh, occurring on top of that to, to cause runoff coefficients to go well above 0.2 to the point where larger fractions of the watershed are generating runoff and, and there's, and there's, and there's um, you know, sizable risk elsewhere in the basin uh, for runoff. So that's helpful at a, at a two by two kilometer scale, but what about field scale? Uh, certainly a lot of, from the research end and, and also in terms of the end user, uh, there's an interest in uh, looking at field scale runoff risk. Um, and so there's a variety of ways to get at this. Uh, we first started out with very simple kind of approach where we were just trying to map out fixed width buffers. Um, you know, fixed distances from the stream to try to map out where we thought runoff was going to occur, kind of just assuming that all the runoff would occur in the near stream zones and we could kind of move these fixed width buffers back and forth depending on the size of the event. Um, they're great, but they don't really represent uh, the reality of variable source area hydrology on the ground. Uh, watersheds in the northeastern U.S. and, and elsewhere in sloped regions uh, where, where topography really got, governs runoff generation um, a lot of watersheds follow the variable source area concept where you have, you know, runoff uh, occurring in areas that are, that are wet due to their topographic position on the landscape. And these areas expand and contract, you know, depending on the moisture conditions and the size of the event. And so ideally we want to go with something that's a little bit more accurate where we have variable width buffers. Uh, they're a little bit more difficult to map, but they're certainly more realistic. 
And in terms of mapping them, there's a variety of ways to get at that. Um, there's these wetness indices that you can calculate based on the topography, just using digital elevation models. Um, and so we've kind of experimented with that approach, and as of others, you'll see that in Zach's presentation too, um, for ways to map these. Um, and so I'll show you one approach that we're taking with um, what's called the depth of water index. Um, we're experimenting with various wetness indices, but this is one that we kind of like. Um, it's defined as the least cost elevation difference from the nearest stream, but all you really need to know is what it's trying to do is tell you on average how deep the water table is as you move away from the stream. So areas that are close to the stream are defined as zero because that's where groundwater intersects the stream. And the further you get away from the stream, the deeper you have to go to get to the, to the regional water table. And so that's what's mapped here. And if I kind of zoom in, you can see what it looks like in kind of one of our headwater streams. Um, and so we can use this index as kind of a way of mapping out where we expect, you know, runoff contribution to occur. Um, and the way we do that is just using runoff coefficients, which I described earlier, but Functionally, a runoff coefficient is just taking the runoff depth, the forecast runoff depth in, in millimeters or inches or whatever, whatever you get, um, dividing it by the depth of rainfall, and that's your runoff coefficient. And so just for one storm that occurred in 2003, I'll kind of run through an example of how we do this. So we got 20 millimeters of rain on October 27th in 2003, um, and 66, oh, I'm sorry, 20 millimeters of runoff and 66 millimeters of rainfall, and the runoff coefficient for that event was 0.3. And so the way this works, um, we'll kind of show you for this little watershed down here. It's the matter of watershed, a small little uh, headwater watershed. So basically what's here, what's graphed is uh, kind of a cumulative distribution of um, depth of water index values for the entire W38 watershed. Um, and the way we do this for when you have a runoff coefficient of, say, 0.3, um, that's basically 30% of the watershed area that's contributing runoff, and you kind of go on this Y index here, you just look to see where that intersects the line. You find out that um, there are 30% uh, you know, of the watershed has depth of water index values that are 6.5 or less. And so we can code those blue and map them out. And that's what's depicted in the bottom left here to basically map out the runoff contributing area in Mattern, for example, this, this small watershed uh, that I'm showing you. And so depending on the runoff coefficient, we can these areas will either expand or contract in size. And so that's kind of how we bring this down to the field scale. Um, we're also trying to corroborate these with actual on-the-ground mapping of saturated areas. Um, and again, you'll also see some of this in Zach's presentation, where we basically send technicians out and we do what's called the wet boot or the squishy boot method. Uh, they have a GPS unit and they just walk around uh, and map these saturated areas um, soon after a rainfall event. Uh, and this is some saturated area mapping that we did right after this uh, October 27th to the 29th rainfall event. You can see where these saturated areas occur, um, and then using different kinds of statistics, which I won't go through here, but uh, we can look to see how well our predicted saturated areas actually map up or, or compare against those that we observed. Um, and so we're, we're trying to do that to, to give some people, people a sense for how accurate and reliable these kind of field scale forecasts really are. Um, and so that's kind of in progress right now. And so the way we see this tool working really is at two different scales. Um, there's a grid scale, grid scale uh, or grid, grid size scale, this two by two kilometer scale, where we're basically using these different decision rules to, to, to color code cells, either green, yellow, or red, dep dependent on the risk. And that's based on the saturation conditions in the watershed and also the size of the runoff coefficient. And then you can zoom in on a given cell if you're interested in seeing kind of a more of a field scale view. And then we can use different kinds of wetness in this indices like the depth of water index that I showed to give you end users a sense for the, the regions of the watershed that are likely to generate runoff or those that are that we would say would be hydrologically connected to the stream. These are the areas where if you applied manure, um, you'd have the greatest risk of uh, runoff occurring and delivering it to the stream in the time scale of an individual event. Uh, and so we don't see our tool as necessarily only a no tool. It's a tool that's trying to give people a sense for where the landscape runoff is likely to occur. There are other areas that are not hydrologically connected to the stream where it would be safe to apply manure at the event time scale. It's just unlikely that runoff would deliver it to the stream uh, if you applied in upslope land areas um, in these kinds of conditions. Um, and so just to summarize, um, you know, we're looking at soil moisture and these runoff contributing area thresholds um, in terms of variable source area hydrology to kind of get it both, uh, you know, try to get down to a field scale tool. Um, 
we need to kind of further evaluate these downscale contributing areas, um, and that's kind of ongoing with various statistics. Um, and we're integrating these into our fertilizer forecaster tool that, I, as I said, uh, hopefully will be online in the four watersheds where we're working uh, by the end of the summer. So uh, I really thank you for your attention. And with that, uh, these are the various partners with whom we're working.